Good morning. Good to see you again. We're going to be looking at John chapter 8, verse 21. But before we begin, why don't we open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us read um, your word today and get to know you better and get to know your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, better. And Um, learn from him, understand him a little bit better, and we pray that you would watch over everyone at home and wherever they may be and protect them during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to start at verse 21, but before we start there, why don't we do a brief recap of the verses we had looked at last week. Basically, Jesus is teaching, and many people are starting to believe in him. Even some of the temple guards are starting to believe in him. And Jesus is showing mercy to people and love and compassion, and he's viewing things in context. And some of the great religious leaders or wealthy religious leaders aren't liking this. And um, some of the religious leaders who are great and wealthy are liking it, but some of them are not. Many of them are not. But um, many of the common people, of the everyday people, are believing in Jesus and are listening to his teachings. And Jesus is successful in his ministry. So that's where we're at. Jesus, in verse 21... Here he is. So he said to them again, Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So many said, will he kill himself since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So Jesus saying that he's not of this world. It's kind of a tricky thing. Because all human beings come from the dust. In Genesis, it records and tells about how Adam was taken from the earth or from the dust. So the word in Hebrew for earth is Adama. And Adam was taken from the Adama, from the earth. And that's how you get the name Adam. So right from the beginning, right from Genesis, you get this sense of, All people are connected to earth. All people come from the earth, come from the world. Jesus is a human being. He's fully God, and he's also fully man. He's also fully human. Um, So he is of the world in that sense. And he was born from Mary. He's born of the Virgin Mary. So... He is of the earth. He is of the world in that sense. He's fully human, right? But he does not rule as many of the powerful people of the world rule. He does not rule through manipulation and through lies and through deceit or corruption. Not that everyone of the world rules this way, right? But there are a good amount of people in the world that do rule this way. Jesus doesn't rule that way. Jesus rules through sacrifice, through love, through generosity, through grace, through giving up his life for all people on the cross, for dying and rising again for them. He exalts the humble. He lifts them high. And he kind of sets low those who are Um, exalted. He humbles those who are exalted, and he exalts those who are humble. 
So Jesus rules with love and generosity and grace. So in that way, he doesn't rule as the world rules. He's not of the world in that sense. Um, Go back to verse 24. Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority. But speak just as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus here, he is making an analogy between his relationship with his heavenly father and the relationship that most men in that day and time had with their earthly fathers. At that time, most men until very recently, actually, most men would do the trade that their father did. If your father was a teacher, you would learn that trade from your father, and you would probably also be a teacher. If your father was a farmer, you would learn that trade from your father, and you would also be a farmer. If your father was a master stonemason, your earthly father, like Jesus' earthly father was, then you would also be a master stonemason. So Jesus, he was a master stonemason. He didn't just make um, basic furniture. He could also make um, complex farming machinery. Um, He could make fountains. He could make statuary of different kinds with stone. He could make a lot of kind of complex items. And this was sort of hard work and difficult work. But in other words, what Jesus is saying here in these verses um, is basically that as an apprentice of your father, of your earthly father, you do what he does. You're representing him. You're representing your family. You're representing your father's trade in everything that you do. You're representing his craft and his trade. And guess what? Your father probably learned his craft and trade from his father and so on and so forth. So there was so much pride in the craft and the trade that you were doing. When you said that you were going to do something a certain way, you took it very seriously and you did it that way. That was the mentality of people in Jesus's day, typically, unless you had maybe... Um, a situation where someone was, you know, just um, an excellent um, teacher or an excellent carpenter or an excellent um, farmer, and they didn't want to go into the military or be a soldier. Maybe they could convince their father or they could convince someone to help them become a carpenter instead or become a farmer instead, if they really had skill in those areas. And that's sort of how the world was until not that long ago. In fact, you did what your father did, usually, typically. A few exceptions here or there where it wouldn't work out that way for any number of reasons, but you would do what your father did, and you would take great pride in that work. So verse 31 So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So this could also be translated, If you abide in my 
teachings or if you abide in my doctrines, the truth will set you free. So a couple things here. So Jesus is perfectly um, representing his heavenly father's doctrines and teachings and his heavenly father's love for all of humanity. And he's all just as he basically um, or always perfectly displayed the trade and the work that his earthly father, Joseph, taught him through stonemasonry, right? And Jesus is saying, abide in my doctrines, abide in the things that I am teaching you, abide in my teachings. And sometimes, you know, I'm sure some of you think, well, doctrine is an old word, and doctrine kind of brings up images or thoughts or ideas that seem kind of old and old-fashioned or something like that. Perhaps some of you are having thoughts like that right now. But it's okay. Um, There's nothing wrong at all with this word, with this doctrine, with these teachings. Um, Teachings and doctrines are good things, and they outline what we believe And they outline what we confess and what we teach. And they sort of give us clear boundaries and clear limits. And they give us um, sort of a clearer sense of freedom on certain things and certain situations. So doctrines are good. And Paul, at one point, he is writing to the church at Thessalonica. And he says, brothers... Dear brothers, do not forsake the um, doctrines or the traditions that I have handed down to you. The teachings or the traditions that I have handed down to you. So doctrines or traditions are not bad things. What I would say to you here is Jesus is um, telling us to abide in his word, abide in his teachings, abide in his doctrines. The church, there were Christians in the world who had the doctrines and teachings of Jesus Christ, of their rabbi, before the New Testament was written. I'm going to say that again, because I think it's good to repeat this. There were Christians in the world before there was a written New Testament, or most of a written New Testament at least, right? St. Stephen in Acts, St. Stephen, probably the first martyr, he is taken, he is dragged to the gates of Jerusalem. He is confessing Jesus. He is confessing his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he is stoned to death. Now, St. Stephen had either no written New Testament or maybe a letter here or there. Maybe, maybe. And he's being stoned to death. Why? Because he believes in his Messiah. He believes in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He believes in the incarnate word, the physical word of God, Jesus And as St. Stephen is being stoned to death by these men, who is holding their coats? None other than Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul. The chief writer, the chief um, writer by the power of the Holy Spirit, inspired by the power of the Holy Spirit, inspired to write the New Testament the large portion of the New Testament. Not all of it, but a good, good portion of the New Testament. So Stephen had faith in the incarnate word. He had the doctrines, he had the traditions of Jesus Christ. And he was believing in Jesus Christ. He was believing in the incarnate physical word, Jesus, as John talks about. Jesus is the physical word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he would hear the gospel, he would hear the stories of Jesus, he would remember his teachings, he would speak it to others, and he had faith. He had a living, vibrant faith in Jesus, so much that he was willing 
to die um, for his faith and be martyred. So the doctrines, the teachings, the traditions of Christianity actually predate the writing of the New Testament. Jesus says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? So please let us pause here for just one moment. Please let us pause. Um, I am just struck by this statement by some of these um, people in the crowd, by some of the um, Jewish people who say that they have never been slaves to anyone here in speaking with Jesus. Let's look back at a few passages from the Hebrew scriptures, if we may. So, the Israelites were enslaved several times. A couple of examples that come to mind would be about um, 700 years before this episode is playing out, that this story is playing out between Jesus and these um, in this crowd. The Assyrians came in and took over the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay? Let me read to you from 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 26. 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 26. And the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Paul, king of Assyria, and the spirit of Tilgath Pilneser, king of Assyria, and he carried them away. Even the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh and brought them unto Hala and Harbor and Hara and to the river Gozan unto this day. Another verse to read. The second Kings chapter 15, verse 29. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria. And he took Ijon and Abel Beth Macha and Jonah and Kadesh and Hazor and Gilead, and Galilee, all the lands of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. So, the Israelites in the northern kingdom had been taken captive. They had been enslaved, as a matter of fact, unfortunately, tragically. Another verse that comes to mind is now about the Babylonian captivity, which was the capturing of more of southern Israel, of the southern kingdom. And this happened a little bit after the um, Assyrian captivity. Okay? So the southern kingdom stood for a little bit longer. It stood um, for maybe about approximately... um, hundred years or so longer than um, the northern kingdom did. But the southern kingdom also did fall. And this is what we read in 2 Kings chapter 24. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. Also he carried into captivity all of Jerusalem. All the captains 
and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. So essentially, the entire city of Jerusalem was taken captive. And when that southern kingdom was sacked and um, taken hostage, and many of those people, many, many of them, were taken back to Babylon, among those people was someone named Daniel. That's the Daniel from the story of um, the lion's den, right? And Daniel became a great prophet. So God worked good even in the midst of that horrible tragedy of the people of the southern kingdom being taken captive. God worked great things and miracles even in the taking of the northern kingdom as well. But I just really wanted to point that out Um, How kind of ironic and strange that is that these folks, that these people are saying they have never been slaves to anyone or that they're because they're children of Abraham. But many um, people in Israel, unfortunately, had been forced into slavery. So I find that kind of strange and kind of ironic. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me, Because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So, as Christians, or as God's people, you could say, Jesus is pointing out, and Jesus is pointing out to um, the people in the crowd here, he's saying, hey, you follow the God of Israel. You are God's people, right? So you have to realize, you have to know that if you sin, um, you're a slave to sin. You're tainted by sin. Again, this is all God's good creation, but it's tainted by sin, right? So anyone who sins is a slave to sin. And he's also saying, and if the Son, if the Son sets you free, then you are free indeed. So as Christians, we are free. We have been freed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the gift of faith that he has given to us through spoken word, through hearing the spoken word. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we can receive that word um, of the gospel with a good and obedient heart that Jesus Christ died for each and every single one of our sins on the cross and rose again. We receive that faith through the gift of holy baptism, through the water and the word um, applied to the body, any part of the body. That person is is, in fact, receiving life-saving faith, faith that saves through the eating and drinking of the body and blood of our Lord and Savior in the Eucharist. We receive life-giving faith. We receive saving faith from our Lord and Savior. Through the sacrament of confession and absolution, we receive life-giving faith from our Lord and Savior. So Jesus, he has set us free. He has absolutely set us free through his work on the cross, through the spoken word, through the sacraments. Jesus has set us free. And we live as Christians lives of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Each and every single day, we live those lives of repentance 
in forgiveness of sins. And that's great news. And we don't have to be slaves to sin. We still sin. We still mess up. We still miss the mark. We still fall short. But we ask Jesus to forgive us. He's quick to forgive. And he does. And that's great news. So here the discussion or the sort of confrontation continues on in verse 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came because you cannot bear to hear my word. So Jesus is saying, hey, only God, only the Son of God can do the things that I'm doing. Only God can raise people from the dead. Only God can heal the sick. Only God can feed multitudes of people. Open the eyes of the blind. Walk on water and do all of these things. So can't you see that I, Yeshua, Jesus, is God? Can't you see that? Can't you see that my Father, I came from Him, and that I and the Father are one, and that He is also God, one God? Separate persons, three separate persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can't you kind of see that? Can't you see that I'm doing the works that only God can do? So Jesus is getting kind of frustrated here and a little bit angry, maybe. Um, He's getting a little bit fed up because he's going back and forth and he's saying, Hey, can't you see? Um, I'm doing the works that only God can do. And I want to reiterate, most people in Israel, the common person, I'm convinced from what I see in Scripture and from extra-biblical study and work that I've done, but especially from what I see in Scripture, the common, everyday person typically loved Jesus. And people started saying things like, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And people were also making confessions like, No one has ever spoken the way that this man has spoken. People were going to Jesus to be healed. People were going to Jesus to have him raise their loved ones from the dead. So most Jewish people, most Israelites, and a lot of travelers and visitors were believing in Jesus as the Son of God, as God in the flesh. And maybe they didn't even completely understand what they were seeing and hearing and experiencing because it was so incredible. Maybe they didn't even have a perfect understanding of what was taking place. But they were believing in him. Um, They were starting to believe, even if it was a small faith or the beginnings of faith, they were believing in Jesus and they liked Jesus, they loved Jesus. But some people did not. Some people did stand against him and were oppositional here or there, okay? Um, So Jesus goes on to say to this crowd that he's sort of debating with and sort of having a little bit of a confrontation with, says, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? Jesus is saying, he's kind of challenging them. 
Point out a sin. If I've sinned, show me. Doesn't seem like anyone can do that, can they? They can't, in fact. Because Jesus is the sinless Son of God. Never sinned. Not one single time. Amazing. If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Many then answered him, We are not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. So Jesus isn't seeking his own glory. Instead, he's standing on the teachings of the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures that came before him. People that testified that he was coming. He stands on God's law and he stands on God's mercy and grace. And Jesus is not building up some great earthly kingdom. He's not having his disciples do that. In fact, when crowds tried to take Jesus to make him as their king, as their earthly king, after he fed the 5,000, he disappeared. Because he wasn't, um, that wasn't his main purpose at that time. That's not what he was trying to do. He wasn't trying to acquire great wealth and power as sometimes or many rulers of the world do. Many rulers of the world, what do they do? They build thrones that are giant skyscrapers and great luxurious buildings with beautiful furniture and beautiful food and music. And that's fine. There's a time and place for all of those things. Those are all good things in their own way and at their own time. But Jesus' throne... Jesus' throne is the cross. He takes the wisdom of the world and he kind of flips it upside down and he dies the death of a common criminal for the sins of the whole entire world on the cross for all people everywhere, every race, every age, every gender, every identification you can imagine no matter how someone identifies in any sense, Jesus Christ has died for them. Jesus Christ loves them, no matter who they are on this earth. Wow. That's kind of uh, powerful to know that Jesus loves all of us, has given up his life for us all, died for us on the cross, and is willing to be humiliated and rejected in that death and resurrection. So Jesus says, I do not seek my own glory. We're in verse 50 here. John 8, verse 50. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Many said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? So the answer is yes, Jesus is greater than Abraham. Jesus is greater than the prophets. He's the son of the living God. In fact, he is God in the flesh. He is the Mashiach, Yeshua Hamash, Yeshua Mash, Hamashiach, Yeshua Hamashiach. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. So who is God? God is the one that Jesus calls Father. Okay? God is the one that Jesus calls Father. And how do we know that Jesus is God? How is it that Christianity stands out from all of the many, many religions that we have before us here today in this world? So many. So many that are before us. Almost like a buffet table. 
where we feel like, wow, we, we have so many things to choose from or to look at or we could pick out from this buffet. But here's the difference. Of all of those religions, of all the wonderful teachings and gifts that they have, only one religion can claim that God rose Jesus from the dead, that God rose that teacher, that leader, that Messiah from the dead. Only one religion has God in the flesh living among us, dwelling among us, tenting among us, dying on the cross and rising again on the third day and promising to come back and restore all of creation. That's the difference. God chose Jesus. God rose Jesus Christ from the dead. And outside of Jesus, there is no salvation. All salvation, all life comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's where eternal life comes from. From his love, from his grace, from his mercy. And when someone dies, no matter who they are, They're in the hands of a very gracious and merciful God. But that is where life comes from. It comes from Jesus Christ, from his death, and from his resurrection on the cross, died, buried, raised again on the third day. He ascended to his Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. That's who Jesus is. And he's standing on the authority of his father. Jesus goes on to say, but you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So many said to Jesus, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Kind of mocking him. They're like, Wow, you've seen Abraham. You're not even 50 years old yet. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, and whenever in the Bible, whenever in the Gospels, Jesus says truly twice, that means it's especially important And we should take um, extra care and extra note of that passage. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. So remember the story of Moses speaking with God. And God is calling Moses to go back to Egypt and set the Israelite people, to set God's people free. Right, God was going to use Moses to do this. Moses is like, wow, who will I tell them that you are God? Who will I even say that you are? He says, um, I am. God says, my name is I am. That's who I am. And Jesus is saying, before Abraham was, I am. Wow. He's saying, I am God. I am eternal. I am from the beginning. I am everlasting. That's who I am. I am Lord of all creation. So they picked up stones to throw at Jesus. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Well, I think that's a good place to stop for today. Next week, we will pick up at John chapter 9. So Jesus is telling us, he's encouraging us that to remember that we have life and forgiveness and grace and abundance in him. Mercy, abundance of forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. We might not have great material possessions, or we might. Could have either one. Either one is fine. But what we know we have is grace, mercy, peace, love, and hope in Jesus Christ. Freedom in him Freedom in his sacrifice on the cross. Freedom in the gifts that he gives us through the holy sacraments. 
through holy baptism, through the Eucharist, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. Those are all names for it, Eucharist, Communion, Lord's Supper, right? We have freedom also in confession and absolution. Jesus forgives us when we confess our sins to him. And he's always ready to hear. He's always ready to listen. And we have pastors who are representatives of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And just as Jesus says in John to his apostles, to his disciples, whenever you forgive sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive sins, they are not forgiven. So when a pastor or a priest, by the call of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, um, standing in representation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when they assure you that your sins are forgiven because of Jesus, because of what he has done, that all your sins are forgiven because of Christ's work on the cross, They are assuring you, they are reassuring you of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forgiving you and loving you. And you can go to sleep tonight knowing that Jesus Christ has taken care of all of your sins on the cross, that you can go to him anytime that you feel guilty about anything or any sin that maybe you've ever committed or I've ever committed or any of us have committed. And he forgives us. And he loves us. He loves the whole world, everyone. And he is merciful. And in Jesus, there is life and hope and forgiveness. And he's the one who was raised from the dead, who's died for the sins of the whole world, and is risen again on the third day. Amen. So why don't we stop there while we end with prayer? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for sending your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross and rise again. In him there is life and hope and forgiveness, and only in him is there eternal life through his sacrifice on the cross. We give you thanks for Jesus and for his love and mercy and grace. And we ask that you watch over us this week, give wisdom to everyone who is um, trying to deal with the coronavirus, give wisdom to all of our leaders here in the United States and throughout the world, places like Italy, in places like China, places like Australia or Iran. Give them godly wisdom in dealing with this terrible situation and watch over all the medical personnel throughout our world who are caring for people who are dealing with this. We give glory to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. See you next week.